Good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome. Uh, tonight with us, we have Mr. Nabdeep Gill. He's a data scientist at SU.ai, and uh, he's a researcher with machine learning. Uh, to ask you questions tonight, we have a rather interesting method. Uh, on this board, you see slido.com, and on that board, too. Log on to slido.com and enter the hashtag V083. This will take you to our event. There you can ask all your questions, which he will answer at the end of the event. Apart from that, I have an announcement about H2O World 2017, which is a flagship uh, data science and AI event from H2O.ai. Uh, it's on 4th and 5th of December. And at the end of the event, we're giving away tickets to that, which is a small contest that we're holding. Thank you. And over to Navdeep now. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me? Everyone in the back, can you hear me OK? Yeah? Cool, cool. So uh, in today's talk, uh, I'll be talking about a topic that's kind of new, uh, machine learning interpretability. So this topic is probably very interesting for people who are in uh, you know, regulated industries. So you know, think of banking, um, some parts of pharmaceuticals, or anything like that, where you kind of have to explain what your predictive model is doing. So that will be the, you know, the topic of today's discussion. And I hope at the end, uh, you guys will gain like a you know a better appreciation and better understanding for these type of methods that I'm explaining. And I will also give a brief demo of our driverless AI product that we released a few months ago. Is is everyone here familiar with that or kind of heard of it? Some people. Okay, I'll give a brief explanation about what the software does in general. What I'm going to focus on is the machine learning interpretability aspect of the product. And at the end. I'll be around for questions, and I'll point you guys to resources to learn more about this product as well. So I'll just get started. So let's just talk about some of the big ideas that um, we mostly get from machine learning. Like, what's the big picture that we're trying to achieve, and how do we normally achieve this? So usually we have some you know, unknown target function. So in this case, for example, think of you know, approving someone for credit. Uh, predicting fraud, churn, anything like that. We really don't know what that target function is. That's why we're turning to machine learning or any of these linear type models that we can use. So what we do is we collect you know, training examples. So this is like historical data that we get um, you know, from, from the field. You know, we query it. And then we have some hypotheses of what we think might be going on. You know, maybe younger people are most likely to uh, default on credit cards or people with a lot of credit lines are more likely to you know, default. And then we pass that through a learning algorithm. And then from that learning algorithm, we either we get you know, a sort of an answer as to what's going on. Now, this is, this is what most of the world's doing today. Um, this is what most of the world's after, I think. I think most people in machine learning are after accuracy, and they're after trying to get the best performance out of a machine learning model. Um, interpretability kind of comes after the fact. Usually when your boss asks, well, why does this work? And you're kind of stuck and you have no idea why. But you know your AUC is you know, 0.95. So maybe that's good, maybe that's not. But what I'm after is you, know, you want to explain this hypothesis to someone. You want to be able to talk to your boss. You want to be able to talk to the stakeholders and explain to them why this phenomenon is happening so they can make better decisions in their business. That's what interpretability is to me. That's what we're trying to achieve. So on another note, we're trying to you know, make sure our machine learning models aren't biased. We're trying to make sure that you know, they're fair, they account for everything, and they're trustworthy. And we don't want any sociological biases in some models that we're building. So if any of you guys are familiar with uh, ProPublica, they published a study um, where they were kind of studying this software called Compass, which is trying to predict you know, uh, predict if someone will go back to prison or not, and they kind of realize that there was maybe some sociological or racial bias in that software itself. So these are the kind of things we're trying to prevent using MLI, machine learning interpretability. Another thing um, we're trying to get from MLI is we're trying to trust the models that we're building. So this is one of my favorite examples. Um, Basically, what we're looking at here is we have our training data set space, which in this case is going from like 40 to, let's say, like 85. And then we put that model in production, and it sees stuff it never saw before, and it goes crazy. It has no idea what's going on. So 
with machine learning interpretability, we also want to you know, do some type of sensitivity analysis with our model and see you know, when does it start being unstable? Um, what is this model's sense of reality? And when does that sense of reality just start going haywire? Uh, that's another thing we're trying to achieve with um, MLI. <clears throat> so here's sort of like the framework for interpretability that I'd like to go over. Um, with most machine learning models, um, the main issue is, is they're very complex. So you know, they're fitting to a space that is very nonlinear. It's kind of hard to understand for you know, anyone just to kind of look at what the model's doing. Um, so what we're trying to do is basically explain that complex phenomena using maybe something simpler like linear models or something like that. And of course, we also want to enhance uh, trust and understanding of the models. So if we're putting a model in production, it's not so much that we care that it's highly accurate. We also want to understand that the decisions that that model is making you know, kind of make sense from a business standpoint. Um, if they don't make sense from a business standpoint, you know, that's, that's kind of a bad thing. That, that kind of means you know, the model's doing something weird and you might be getting lucky. Um, so these logical things are things that you want to achieve using MLI. So like I said earlier, um, one of the, the big challenges is of course that the machine learning model itself is highly complex. So with linear models, you have strong model locality. So that usually means the model's pretty stable and you can explain it. So think of like a logistic regression, a linear regression. Um, you can show someone this equation and explain to them what's going on um, without doing anything fancy. Like you could literally look at what that function is doing and tell someone what's going on. The problem with machine learning is, is it has weak model locality. So sometimes the models can be pretty unstable, like I showed you earlier with that plot where the model was just going haywire. And, and it's kind of difficult to explain to someone what's really going on with a complex machine learning model. So think of you know, a highly deep neural network or a GBM with thousands of trees. It's very difficult to actually explain to someone what's going on. So this is a comparison of just linear models versus um, machine learning models. So for the linear models, we have you know, exact explanations for approximate models. So for example, here's a plot of number of purchases by age. And you can kind of make this statement like you know, for one unit increase in age, the number of purchases increases by 0.8 on average. It's a typical linear regression scenario. You can do this from a linear model. The problem is with a linear model, it's approximate. So that's one issue with linear models, is you're approximating to what's actually happening with the data. So there is room for error. With a machine learning model, they approximate explanations for exact models. So you can see here that this machine learning model is fitting exactly um, to the data. So it's fitting you know, uh, very well, but explaining this might be quite difficult. You can't make that same statement you made earlier. So, so far I've kind of gone over, you know, how machine learning models can be quite complex. It can be quite difficult to explain to people, even though it's highly accurate, that's sometimes not what you're after. What you're really after is explaining this phenomenon to someone and modeling it in such a way that will help your business or help the problem you're trying to solve. I've also explained that with linear models you can achieve this, but you might take a hit in accuracy. It might not be the most powerful model that you can achieve because linear models are once again approximating to the data. They're not fitting exactly, and they really don't have the capability to fit exactly unless you do some you know, polynomial transformation or, or something like that, which makes it complex once again. So now what I want to do is go over a few different techniques that you can use for MLI. So techniques that you can use to explain um, complex models. So this first technique is called uh, partial dependency plots. So is there, has anyone heard of PDPs before, partial dependency plots? Okay. So basically, with, with a partial dependency plot, you have your model. Let's say it's a GBM. And with a partial dependency plot, what it does is it takes one variable, 
and it varies that variable, and then it scores with that particular model. And then you get the average response across these um, um, different values for the variable. So for example, you guys probably can't see it, but let's say we're looking here at like house age. So this is a housing data set, and if we have a variable like house age, a PDP plot for that would be go across different bins of house age, set that to every row in the data, score, and give me the average prediction across these uh, different values. So it kind of gives you a sense of how this model is responding to age. Now also, in this one, you, what you can see from this um, housing data set is this is showing a two-dimensional um, PDP plot. So as you see, we, on this axis over here, we have average occupants for the house. And on the other axis, we have house age. You can see that the average occupancy is not really changing with house age. Or I'm sorry, you can see that house age is not really changing across the response function. So house age by itself does not have a huge effect on the model. However, once we start looking at the other dimension of average occupancy and we start varying that with house age, you can see there's some variation. So this kind of gives you some indication of an interaction that's going on in the model. So this one technique can kind of, kind of um, give you that full picture. So this next um, technique is called surrogate models. So the way surrogate models work is a very old technique from data mining. And what you're mainly trying to do is, let's say you have this very complex model. Let's say it's a complex neural network. And let's say it's highly accurate. Um, with that complex model, you can you know, score all of your data, and you have a bunch of predictions. What you can do then is build a surrogate model, which is a simple model that is fit to the predictions of that very complex model. So let's say a surrogate model is a single decision tree, and you can fit that to what the deep neural network predicted. What that will give you is sort of a simpler space and an interpretable model that um, can help you kind of gain some logic behind what's going on. So this is just another technique, a very old technique, but a very powerful technique in um, MLI. So this next technique is uh, local interpretable model agnostic explanations, or otherwise known as LIME. So the main idea behind LIME is, is to fit um, local linear models to a response function. So the idea here is we have some complex model, let's say we're trying to predict you know, what an image is or something like that. And we fit tiny linear models to different parts of the response function to kind of understand what's going on. Um, you can do this across different types of rows and different types of data sets to kind of, you know, um, to kind of gain an understanding of what's going on in this response function. This is a technique that's relatively new, and we do a variant of this with our own MLI technique as well, which, which I'll explain later. So this last one is uh, variable importance. So with a variable importance technique, we can do it in twofold. The first way to do it is a global variable importance. So this is the common one you would see in something like a GBM or random forest. And basically, the global variable importance uh, kind of indicates the impact that each variable has on the model. And the way we kind of interpret that is, you know, for a GBM, for example, we want to see how many times does this variable show up on the top of each tree. You know, the more times it shows up, you know, the more important it is from a global aspect. So this is, I think when I say global, that's across the whole data set. So on average, this is how important that variable is. This second uh, variable importance technique is called uh, LOCO, and that stands for leave one covariate out. So an example of that is, is let's say we have a row of data. This first one is a male. And then we have their original prediction, which is y hat, 0.2. Now we're interested in what happens to that prediction if we set their, their, um, their variable sex to nan. So we remove it. Then we get a prediction, and then we take that prediction and subtract it from the original. The impact is the difference of that prediction. 
So it kind, of, it kind of gives us an inclination on what's going on with that particular row, and it gives us a more local explanation of what's going on. So like earlier, you have a variable importance across the entire data set. With local, we have variable importance for a specific row or a specific subset of data. So this is sort of this global versus local interpretability. So now I'll just go over a quick demo of the MLI uh, software that we have in driverless AI, in which all of these methods are you know, available to you to use. So what I have on the screen now is uh, what we currently offer as our machine learning interpretability software through driverless AI. Um, I can go over driverless AI after the talk. I want to spend this time going over the MLI aspect, but if anyone has questions after, feel free to come by and get me and I'll answer any question you guys have. So in this dashboard, this is our MLI dashboard, and what we First did is we ran an experiment through driverless AI on, the, on this data set called the credit card data set from Kaggle. So if you guys are familiar with that, is this one right here. So this is a you know, credit card data set from Kaggle. It's, it's, from, uh, it's from Taiwan. The timelines are from April 2005 to September 2005. Um, in terms of the data set itself, you're just trying to predict default. So like, you know, someone's the likelihood to default on a, on a payment. So some of, the, you know, some of the features we have are like limit balance, so how much credit was given to a person, we have sex, education, marriage, age. Um, we have these um, categorical variables called like pay zero to pay two, pay three. This is just the repayment status for that particular month. So different values could be like, like negative one, uh, they paid, one payment delay for a month, two payment delay for two months, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what these variables sort of represent. And then we also have the bill amount, which is you know how much money were they charged for that particular uh, bill and how much did they actually pay. So did they underpay, did they pay on time, you know, things like that. So that's sort of the experiment we ran and we were, it's a classification problem, so we're trying to predict the probability of default, like I mentioned before. So once we ran that experiment, we came up to this MLI page to sort of interpret what the model did. So the way MLI works in driverless AI is like this. Driverless AI is going to build its own model and it's going to make some predictions on the data set. What MLI does is it takes those predictions, which probably came from some stacked ensemble or a complex XGBoost model, and it builds a surrogate GBM, which is, so the surrogate model, like I mentioned before, is a simple model that's fit to a complex response function. So in this case, we took those predictions, we made that a response, and we built sort of this default H2O GBM. So 50 trees, you know, you know very tiny data, uh, very tiny model, but the thing we're after here is, you know, interpreting what driverless AI actually did. So once we fit that, we have this dashboard here. So on the top left, we have our, you know, our K-line plot so K-Lime is a variant of the Lime method I mentioned earlier. So the way K-Lime works is, is uh, pretty straightforward. The first part of the algorithm is you cluster your data. So we cluster the data into you know, anywhere from five to 10 clusters. Once we have those clusters, in each cluster we build a linear surrogate model for that cluster. So that linear surrogate model is gonna explain that cluster in the data set. We also build a linear surrogate model for the entire data set. So at the end, we end up with K plus one surrogate models. And the way we evaluate how well the surrogate model did is we look at the R squared of the surrogate model. So we wanna know how much variance is accounted for from that linear surrogate model. So that's the main gist of how K-Lime works in MLI. So in the top left, what you see as the white points are what the global K-Lime model predicted. And this yellow band over here, the yellow band that's going across the white points, that is what the surrogate GBM predicted. And these points on the bottom and top 
are the actual target values. So in this case, we're predicting probability of default, so it's just zeros and ones. Now, the main thing to get out of this plot is, you know, how close are those white points to the original model or the GBM surrogate model? Right now, it seems like there's some variance, but, you know, it's, it's never gonna, the surrogate model's never gonna be perfect. But what we're really after here is, you know, if, if we're relatively close to the complex model, and if we can um, feel confident that the errors are not too far off. Over here is just the global variable importance. So the variable importance is something you would get from a typical XGBoost model or a H2O GBM or anything like that. So in this case, you know, the most important variable is this pay zero. And pay zero is the repayment status in September, which is the last month in this data set, so the last you know, date for this data set. So that seems to be the most important, which makes sense, because if you, you, know, you paid your bill on time for the last month or not, that's gonna be highly predictive of what you're gonna do the next month. So that's just global uh, variable importance. Down here, so the, you know, the bottom left, is we have our surrogate decision tree model, so what we did with this one is we took, the, we took the predictions from the complex model and we fit a single decision tree to those predictions to kind of give this simple uh, surrogate model that can kind of give us some insight into what's going on. You know, what path is this complex model taking from an approximate standpoint? Um, the main thing you would want to be after when evaluating this is the root mean squared error of the surrogate model because that tells you how far away you are from the models, from the complex model's prediction. So we're not really interested in how far this model is from you know, the zeros and ones, we're interested in how far is it from the complex model, because that's what we're trying to approximate. So basically when I look at the surrogate model, what I see is you know, for pay zero, if you got a value of negative one, which means you paid on time, or you, were, you got a value of negative two, or plus two, so then that, you know, delay by two months or delay by one month, you kind of fall in this bucket. And the way the UI works for this decision tree is where most of the population falls, those bands are bigger, they're thicker. So you see most of the population is going to the left of this surrogate model, in which is approximating the complex um, machine learning model that we built earlier. And they all seem to be following the, you know, the same trend so, you know, you have pay zero, if, if you're sort of paying on time and you're still paying on time, you know, this, you're, you know, you're not gonna default, basically what we're getting from here. And the plot on the bottom right is the partial dependency plot. So this plot basically is showing how the GBM surrogate model varies when we um, change the pay zero value on average for each prediction. So as we vary from negative one, negative two, zero, one, these yellow points represent the average response this surrogate model is giving. So this sort of gives us a um, distribution for the response when we keep everything static but vary a specific variable. So we're sort of getting, um, like I said, a distribution of what's going on with the response function. So, this is what we get from a global point of view. So the main idea that a user should try to achieve from a global MLI dashboard is sort of a narrative, something that makes sense to you as a business holder, something that makes sense to you in terms of presenting to you know, your stakeholders, to your boss. You're, you're, you're trying to see, like, you know, does this MLI dashboard make sense? And if it doesn't make sense, that sort of means you don't trust you know, the complex model that was built before. And it sort of is a way of debugging that model and going back and changing what you did, changing the strategy that you took. Now, those are the, the you know, the global overview of what MLI is doing. If you want to get a local view of everything, we can look at a point like, let's see, you can go up here in the search bar and we can pick a point based off of its row ID. And I know this point is someone that is highly probable of defaulting. 
So everything on the dashboard just kind of updated there. So I chose a point that was highly likely to default, and that point is up here. And then over here, we're able to see its local variable importance. And you can see for this particular person, um, pay zero is highly important, pay two is on par, um, as well with the global. Age and limit balance aren't as important for this person compared to the average of the rest of the group. And we also see that this person in the surrogate model went to the, went to the least likely side or the side to default as well. So this makes sense because, because pay zero for this person and you know, they're, they're highly late on their payments and they've been highly late on their payments for a very long time. So this should sort of give you some confidence as to what you're seeing. Um, when it comes to these classification problems, a good way with MLI is to look at the extremes and see if they make sense. Then you can start looking at stuff in between. But you can sort of debug models by looking at extreme cases you know, to see if they make sense to you from, from a user and a, and a business uh, user standpoint. So the next thing I wanted to show you guys is on the top right here, there is a tab called explanations. So what these explanations give is sort of like, they give you an English ex explanation as to what is going on. So, so for this particular person, we saw that their, their default payment next month, that they actually defaulted. The model predicted 88% of defaulting. The K-Lime surrogate model predicted 87%. And the K-Lime prediction accuracy, which is the R squared accounted for, is about 98%. So the surrogate model itself is fitting very well to the complex response function. The only difference is, is we don't have to look at the complex response function anymore. We can be confident that we can look at this surrogate model and use these English explanations um, to give to people and explain to them as to what's going on. And down here, are showing you the top three most important variables for this person and you know the least top or in the bottom three variables that aren't important for this person. And as you can see, like the verbiage that you're seeing here is what you would see for a linear regression model. So as this increases by one unit, this will happen to the outcome. Um, so this is this is highly uh, I think powerful for someone to use because they can take, you know, like I said, they can take complex functions and reduce it down to something simple and present these to a wider audience, and that wider audience can understand what's really going on with this, with this machine learning model. And also, the last thing is, is as a user's you know, using this dashboard, they might have questions as to what is, you know, what is going on with each panel, or what is going on uh, in the entire dashboard. So you could, you could always click on the MLI docs page and that'll open up to the MLI booklet that H2O has, has to offer in which we explain um, every algorithm being used and how we use it and why we do the things we do. So I think I've more so or not said what I wanted to say. Um, I kind of want to open the floor up to questions to see if, actually I think we're going to use the, yeah, Slido. Oh, actually, one more thing. I almost forgot. So before this meetup, about a few days ago, I started making a repo called MLI Resources under H2AI. This is sort of all of the MLI literature and everything all put together in one place for people to kind of get a hold of and to read up on. And also, we have simple notebooks that people can try out these algorithms, so these Python notebooks. So these methods like, you know, um, like decision tree surrogate, Lime, Loco, um, things about PDP, sensitivity analysis, they're all available um, in the open source in this repo. And the links are on the slide and they'll be available to everyone as well. Okay, so the first question here is, if a surrogate predicts as well as the complex function, is it still necessary to first predict with a complex model for the same type of data? Well, 
what the surrogate model is doing is it's predicting to the response of that complex model. So you sort of want that highly accurate um, outcome first, and then you want to get a simpler surrogate model to fit to that, to that prediction. So you can um, get a more simpler explanation as to what's going on. So in this case, it, it, it probably wouldn't be the same. So this is saying like, you built a GBM with 5,000 trees, max depth 10, highly accurate. Um, that's not the same as saying build a GBM with one tree and try to predict the same thing. It's not, it's not gonna work the same way. We're just trying to predict to the complex model's response and try to explain that model. Um, so like, think of the data set that, you, that your, your training data set is sort of, sort of the reality you have a hold of then your model has its own sense of reality. We're trying to explain the model's sense of reality. What does the model think is going on? That's what we're trying to achieve here. The next question is, what's the pricing for driverless AI? I can talk about that after, or I can put you in touch with someone that, that, that knows more than me. Okay, so the first question here is how do you account for covariance between variables? So I guess I'm, when, I, when I hear that question, I'm thinking it means you know, highly correlated variables. So with that, you could do some pre-processing steps. These are things that me and a few colleagues here have talked about. Um, you could do things like correlations to see you know, how highly correlated are the variables to each other. Um, that might hinder your surrogate model if it ends up being a linear model because you are gonna use the raw features again. So you might want to take the same techniques that you would for, let's say, a linear regression um, when, when building out your complex model if you're after interpretability. So the next question here is, how will it work for image classification in convolutional neural nets where there is no feature names in advance? Well, if there's no feature names in advance, um, I guess, I mean, when I think of image classification, I'm not sure if many people are after interpreting, if they're more so after accuracy. Um, most of the problems we've dealt with in MLI are very business related. So things like, you know, traditional business. So like fraud, churn, um, default, things like that, where, you know, there is, there is some value in interpreting. Um, I don't know, you know, well enough to kind of answer this question fully, but I would think if you don't really know what the feature names are, then interpreting is going to be quite difficult. So for this next question is, is it possible that you might not be able to find a surrogate model? What might be the reasons? Um, yeah, I think it is possible that you probably won't be able to always find a surrogate model. if. I mean, I haven't encountered that myself with certain data sets that I've tried, but I would think it is possible if the original model is highly complex or there's just too many variable transformations that you're doing that are highly complex. So think of like, think of something like, you know, if you're doing a bunch of target encodings or things like that and you're trying to interpret those, those might be kind of difficult to do. So here is, what is the best method to understand your model when you don't know anything about your features or raw complex sensor data? So if you don't know anything about your features and trying to interpret what's going on would be a, you know, a big task. Um, one of the things that we have with MLI or some of the demos we show is we know what each feature is and we sort of have this data dictionary as to what's going on. Um, if you don't really understand the data, then I think the first thing to do is highly, highly explore the data and really try to understand the domain that you're in. If it's sensor data, then I would assume you, you know what certain things mean and you probably can hypothesize as to what variables are. Um, but other than that, I think it would be a very difficult thing to do. So the next question is, is what platform does the code use? Um, this, well, it says anonymous, but if you mean like what the, what the dashboard was written in, um, the dashboard itself is, you know, TypeScript, and then the back end is Java. So all the algorithms are running on Java for now. So right now, the question is, what 
data source does driverless AI support. For now, the data sources are typical CSV files or text files or any sort of separated type file that can be imported. Uh, there is no DB connectors yet. The next question is, is please explain how H2O's DL variable importance works. Oh. Sorry, what was that? I, that one I will have to look up. So the next question is, how broad is the class of ML algorithms that your MLI techniques apply to? For example, across classes of neural nets, deep learning. So in terms of the ML algorithms, um, all MLI really needs is the ability to to be supervised and it just needs the ability to score. And now since MLI is using a surrogate model from the get-go, um, it can take in any supervised model. Um, so deep learning model, GBM, random forest. Um, in terms of any linear model, there wouldn't be a point because you could already interpret it. You could already figure out what's going on with the linear model. But in terms of other supervised algorithms, MLI can handle those. The next question is, are libraries optimized for GPUs? So driverless AI is optimized for GPUs, but H203 itself as a library is, a, uh, is not optimized for GPUs. So I think I answered that one. The next one is, have you considered uh, factor analysis principal components by one, using factor loads for attributions, rerun your model on uh, factors instead of attributes? Uh, we haven't considered this for MLI. Uh, some of the techniques we use in driverless AI as part of the feature engineering do things similar to this. But when it comes down to interpreting the model, we use the raw features that were fed in because we are still exploring in which how uh, we are still exploring how we can explain fe like features that were engineered to someone because sometimes these engineered features can be complex to explain or they might not be straightforward for MLI so this is something we're still um, exploring the next question is do you know how fully explainable models from optimizing mind work no next question is are there any non-black non box class of ANN models? I mean, I guess you can make a model non-black box if you make it simple enough. So I would say yes. Why did you choose RMSC for models? Did you try MAE or any log loss functions depending upon use case? Uh, we just picked RMSE because that was just that was just something we thought would fit in with what we're trying to predict. Um, in this case, we're always predicting something continuous because it's, if it's classification, we're predicting the, 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 the predictions from the complex model. So it's anywhere from zero to one. So we thought RMSE was a good way to go. Uh, we have thought about MAE. Uh, what we've actually thought about is just giving the user all of the relevant metrics that they can look at from a surrogate model and leave it up to them to figure out what they find important and what they find not important. Question? Aren't you just using the complex models to do model selection for your simpler model, essentially? Sorry, what was that? Aren't you just using a complex model to do some sort of model selection or feature selection and then build your simpler model on it? Sorry, what are you? What are you, what are you I mean, so you build a complex model. Mm -hmm. Then you identify the features you want to use in your simpler model. It's not just models, feature selection. Well, the way, so the way it so, so the way it works now is we, we build out this complex model through driverless AI, and then we use those predictions and map them to the original raw features because 
we still haven't figured out how to explain those you know, uh, features that were engineered through driverless AI. So one of the big components, just as a side note, of driverless AI is this automatic feature engineering. So we're generating a bunch of these features and basically making your data set wider with more features that we find are important. Um, from an MLI standpoint, we thought that using the original raw features are more valuable to the user because those are features that we're pretty sure the user will understand if it's a data set that they work with day to day. So that's why we were using the raw features instead of those uh, engineered ones. Is there any way to see the engineered ones? So the engineered ones you can see um, as you're running an experiment, there's a variable importance chart about the engineered ones. And in the UI, if you hover over those, it'll kind of give you a brief description, so like a little tool tip as to like what happened. Like why, you know, what does this feature represent? Yes. All right, thanks, Navdeep. So for everyone that stayed, uh, our contest for the H2O World tickets, if you're sitting, if you want to grab a seat real fast, because if you look under your seat and there's a yellow dot, you won a $395, $395 ticket to H2O World this year. So thank you guys for staying. Um, if you won, just come to the front. And uh, it should be towards the front of your chair, a yellow dot that has a W. So if you have one of those, bring those up to me, and then I'll give you a ticket to H2O World.